I would say it's a little bit uh, scary for me to be in front of the public without a public. So very soon I'm going to have to uh, pull out a public. Uh, so I thought I'd start with just telling you that uh, uh, because I saw I saw some of them. So how old are you? Eight years. Eight years. So what's your name? Vedant. Vedant. I was as old as Vedant when I got my first copy. Uh, maybe give or take a few years. And it really, really changed my life. Uh, I think I was a handful. And this was my, my mother was hoping that something would divert my attention and it worked. And I have to say it was a real blessing in disguise because uh, uh, I'm one of those lucky people who found my calling very early in life. Uh, I, I can't say it was without a struggle that that I became a professional puppeteer because the whole idea is you don't do this professionally, at least not in our country. And it turns out not in most countries. If you say, uh, what do you do? I'm a puppeteer. Most people are like, huh? <laughs> or is that a job? What's your real job? And a lot of people also say, <laughs> so, it's usual. But uh, so that was the big deterrent. Uh, in choosing this as a profession, but luckily, by the time I was about to finish college, this was there was no two ways about it. Uh, there was a childhood hobby which had gone all wrong and completely taken over my life and my mind, and uh, there was no escaping it. And so I became a puppeteer. Uh, and Kolkata Puppet Arts Trust started, and incidentally, we just turned ten as a trust, but we've existed since 1998. Uh, it's been a long journey and to cut a long story short, it's been a journey of essentially discovering that once you decide you want to be a puppeteer, there are no schools. You know, you're left to your own devices, essentially cutting up soft toys, which your brothers and sisters are not very happy about, essentially cutting up your mother's kanji madam which she's not very happy about, essentially, uh, you know, borrowing, stealing stuff from people and turning them into puppets and they come and see the show and say, isn't that my lace <laughs> curtain and that they're not too happy about. So it was a long journey of doing that for a while and making some really horrible dysfunctional puppets. Uh, because constantly you discover that there's nobody to teach you. And this is this is not you know a skill where you are just musically inclined and you hear music everywhere and the wings turn into music. It's a plastic art form. You really need to know that this glue goes with this material and uh, I remember sitting up one night with Thermocall making a lion puppet trying to stick his hair with rubber solution glues. So of course there were holes in it and the sculpture had died by the morning. So there, you need someone to tell you this kind of stuff which is the science of it. So a lot of years of just trial and error quite painful uh, years of trial and error till um, I discovered more mad people like me and end of college uh, there were some people who were really excited about it, some who by virtue of being best friends had been coerced into doing puppet shows with us and some who had been bribed into doing puppet shows with us and so a little group was formed and uh, for a few years my people were still figuring out what to do with after college the group ran and then everyone discovered their own careers and boom! I was left alone, uh, but I have to say, uh, it's it, I'm really grateful to be allowed to be an artist. And on hindsight, you realize what a privilege it is to have the luxury to be an artist, uh, where you have support, where people say it's okay, you're not crazy, uh, you're not easy, and you're not trying to escape reality, and. That is something I realize now, that was good. Um, well, to cut a long story short, soon enough I was uh, lucky to go to public school and uh, I think my entire world changed because you realize that people are saying this is science. Uh, people have written about public theater, there's theory and there's uh, a lot of thought about what public theater is. And I'd like to just share a few things, and this is uh, over the few years become our philosophy of puppet theatre. So um, there are many approaches to moving puppets. One of which is of course putting your hand into a sock and begins to be shaking it. 
Um, and that's something they are hoping to change in India because uh, that's not really publish. That's not really the magic of uh, Also, the idea is that a puppet is a doll with strings attached to it. Uh, and that also, uh, for me, is at this point a very limited idea of what puppets are. And we're moving towards saying puppets are any inanimate thing that can be animated. So at this point, I would like a gentleman's shoe if I Add a gentleman's shoe. Just one. You can keep the other one. Oh, he. Okay, yeah. He's on the team. Thank you. Training and learning as a puppeteer. 
um, one of the first things we learn to do is understand how movement works. So if you see our body, there are only three kinds of movements that are possible. Rotations, inclinations, and dips. These are rotation joints, inclination joints, it's lots of inclination. And dips. And uh, we study a little mind, and it's applied to this body. Uh, so in, in principles of mind, especially corporal mind, which I use a lot personally, there are five divisions in the body. The head. But what is really important to understand is puppet theater is not so much about moving as it is about not moving. I would say they're equally important, but not moving is just a tad bit more. Because when everything moves, it's really not. But when one, thing, one little thing moves, the puppet suddenly starts to come down. And that's because in our bodies we are not constantly moving. You know, it's impossible. Uh, we move very particular things to gesticulate and articulate, and even to be alive. And that's one of the most important things in the puppet's body as well. So the five parts of the body, as uh, explained in corporal mind, head, hammer, which is the head and the neck, the bust, head, neck, up to the shoulder, torso, up to the waist, and trunk, the full body. And then we learn that there are two extremes in movements. The super fast movement or the talk. So in a talk, you saw my hand go close to the table, you heard the sound and you then saw the hand move away. But you couldn't see the entire part of the movement. That's the part. And the other extreme is a falling movement. So, can I if we do a wave? Show me a wave. Do you know how to do a body wave? Like a break down this wave? Can you? Come, 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 show me a wave. Show me a wave. It's no one. Ooh, fabulous. That's a fall move. She's about here already. That's, <laughs> that's a point where you see the beginning, middle, and the end of the movement, the entire part of the movement. So five divisions, two speeds, and you can do several emotions. So I'm going to work with the neck, head and neck, which is called the hammer, and inclination, rotation, and tilt, three kinds of movements. So we're going to do hammer, inclination, and I'm going to do two speeds. That's a fun What motion do you see? What is the purpose of this? Now we're going to do the top. Shock. Sit down. Fear or shock? Fear or shock. Uh, you do the same thing with the rotation.
the sleep breath, which is really natural, it's a regular, regulated movement. But once the puppet gets up, it's not breathing on the land. It's a punctuation, the breath. And we focus a lot on constantly keeping alive the illusion that he's breathing every now and then. And we go back to sleep. The next thing is the eyes, and that's very important to make keep puppet alive. So this one doesn't have eyes. <laughs> no real eyes. And a lot of our puppets don't have eyes because if you have eyes with pupils in it, the tendency is that the puppet's like this. <laughs> you know, and it's, it doesn't look alive. So this is a this is a trick thing, not having eyes. Because what I can do with this is Back bends forward. 
lose height. And you take support with your hands. And this is realistic, and the other one is just silly. Sometimes it's funny. People find it funny, but they also are like, oh. Because you can see what has just happened to the body. Um, so this is as far as technique goes, and now I just sort of come back to the work that we are doing and what we like in the puppets. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we really started working with the epics. And like Samira was saying, uh, one of the things that was fascinating is because there is no puppet school in India, uh, and most of us puppeteers have to train in, in, in schools around the world. One of the things you really miss is this root. You don't know what the roots of your puppet are. And uh, the big shift for me was in 2003. Uh, I ended up doing this job. I have to say, I didn't like the job very much, but uh, it was fascinating because it was, it was for uh, the culture department in Delhi. It was uh, to assist as a festival coordinator at a public festival. And it was a slightly painful job because it was a Sarkari office. So there was a lot of red tape and a lot of like, just waiting for things to move when uh, four months spent like a year and all of that happened. But what was an enormous part of that experience is uh, I started to meet traditional puppeteers. And uh, I went to public school in, in Sweden and really unfortunately that's the first time I encountered the traditional forms in India. Not in India. Of course in the cities you know Rajasthan, you cut trees and we see shadow puppets because you have the leather shadow lamps at Sula Chukun and all these crafts pillars. And you know these vaguely and they're in the back of your head because you're a puppeteer but you don't really know what happens. And for me, the most exciting part was my job was to help the puppeteers set up, make sure they ate and drank and you know, stayed generally hydrated and healthy. Um, every night, they would set up for the next day. And I would help them set up from 9 in the night to 4 in the morning. And those were magical because there's a theatre in Delhi, in if any of you know Delhi, where the, the theatre uh, hub is, it's called Mandi House where National School Drama is and Kamani is and all those places. There's a theatre under a tree, it's an outdoor space. So you have to set up necessarily at night. In the morning, there are no lights, everything is inside. And at night in the night, these puppeteers would start opening up their four glass. And there were always four glass, or trunks, or these really old bags. And an owl would come to the puppets, and under the tree, they would start singing their songs and playing with these shadow puppets. And I think my world exploded. Uh, because there are 17 living traditional forms in India as we speak. Rajasthani Kratuti is only one. Leather shadow puppets of uh, whatever you might have seen, Andhra or Karnataka, is only part of the game. These are 3,500 year old uh, traditions, the oldest being the leather shadow puppet, and the oldest puppet form might have come from Maharashtra. It was called Chakraji Pakhuti. It was very exciting because it doesn't exist anymore. And the puppeteers migrated out of Maharashtra and went all over the country. And now you have leather sh shadow puppets in Odisha, which are called Rapa and Chaya. Uh, in Kerala, which is called Torba Bakutu. In Karnataka, it's called Tobal Bombayada. In uh, Andhra Pradesh and Tamil Nadu, they're called Toru Bombalata and Tor Bombalata. And they're quite similar. But beyond this, nothing about the history. They look different. They are colored in a different way. Their size is really varied. The small ones being the uh, Karnataka sh shadow puppets. And you have these giant six feet tall puppets in Andhra. But the one thing that binds them is the narratives. And that is the Ramayana and Mahabharata. What is really exciting is, I've never heard the narratives which are seen. Never. So if you go to uh, Odisha, the story is from the... One yeah. You're saying all these living forms, yeah. they're all telling the story of the epics. Yes. The epics and the Puranas. All these forms. All these forms. Yeah. Except for the Rajasthani Because there it's a completely, it's a, it's a 
it's a form with no uh, ritual connection. It's uh, it was it's a very interesting form. We call it a PR form because Amar Singh Rathod, the Maharaja of Nagpur, appointed the puppet, puppeteers to tell his story and his version of the story. And in, in that version, not only does he defeat Akbar and Jahangir, but also Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb, which is a little bit impossible. Because uh, these emperors spanned over 200 years. But it's, a, it's very interesting that this happened and they were given this money. It's a job. Very Gandhi's law. And off the puppeteers went. And these are the puppeteers all of us know about. Because the string puppeteers of Rajasthan is something everybody watched. They were in Mohalla for the last 400 years. They only existed for 400 years. They have taken over our imagination much more than any of the other puppeteers. So much so that the word for puppets in Hindi is Kathuti. You know, there's no other word for puppets. Um, so my first encounter was with a uh, leather shadow puppeteer from Kanta and he started telling these stories. First he showed me nine Hanumans and that confused me very much. Nine Hanumans? So one is green, one is white, one is red and small, the other one is red and big but it's fangs. Then there's a black one, there's a little one, there's a large one, there are all sorts of colors, all sorts of forms. And he says, yeah, because he has so many emotions. I can't have the same puppet doing all the emotions. So there are nine different numbers, and there are all these stories about these characters. Um, then I encountered puppets in Bali. And you suddenly realize that the Ramayana is completely changed. It's completely, because Hanuman is clear that why it's Hanuman. <laughs> And the Ramakri and the Thayat. But our uh, Hanuman is a Brahmachari. So you're wondering, hmm, what happened to Peter Dayan Bali? <laughs> Very interesting. Uh, and so you're wondering, where is the connection? How is this person going there? And one of my favorite characters are the Vibhushapas, the jesters, the clowns. Because while the Ramana and the Mahabharata are playing in the temple and the mostly played temples or during ritual functions. The story is a bit distant from the audience, but the two jesters can do anything. So they are the real link with people. So they can temporize the Ramana and the Mahabharata. They come and talk about current issues. I saw one version where it's in the middle of a temple in Andhra and it's there, like everyone's dressed in their best attire and women have flowers in their hair. You know, the Pandit does all this puja shuja and the performance begins and then Ravan is killed and the two jesters come in and they start collecting a thing. And one of them pops in and says, What are you doing, Ravan? What are you doing? Ravan says, Bhug lagne, Ravan let me know. So, even a scene like that is immediately broken down and everyone is laugh laughing and it's, you know. So, Hanuman often comes in peace on stage. This is happening in a temple. And this is allowed. And this is the power of the puppet. Because the puppet here otherwise is a man who is very ordinary, normal, when he gets behind the shadow curtain and he starts telling these crazy and extraordinary stories. I've seen a 65-year-old puppet here with uh, the onset of Parkinson's. His name was El Rajapa. He used to live in Adi Shakti. And we were looking at him shaking. And he's moving behind the shadow curtain. And he's alone. Suddenly the show starts, and there are four, and then there are six, and then there are something eight puppets on stage. And he's singing, and there's the khartal is playing, and there is some string instrument playing, and there's some drum or percussion instrument, and he's flipping puppets and holding puppets, and he does the entire uh, killing of Megna episode because uh, there the forms keep changing. So it comes six different animals, and he switches an animal, and another one comes on. And all our, jo our jaws are dropped to the floor. And we're wondering how many people are in there. The show finishes and he walks out <laughs> So, the, really, the, the stories that these people have within them, and the energy and the power, and he's forgotten that he's had breakfast, but he has not forgotten the 2000 verses he knows from the Ramayana. Because they start learning when they're about three years old. Um, and this fascinates me. And this makes me realize that 
this kind of immersion in a story and an immersion in a form is something I would love. So I love puppets. I don't do crazy puppets. I know that I love puppets here. But where are my stories coming from is something I'm really trying to discover. And this engagement with the epics has been a very powerful journey in discovering what the epics hold. And of course people have said, oh, have you suddenly, uh, have you suddenly been hit by religion by moving over the epics? But I don't think the epics are about religion. I don't think the epics are about one-ism, one uh, or another. You can interpret them in a hundred years, all that and more. It's like watching the ocean, a painter could be looking at the ocean and thinking of his next painting, a poet could be thinking of a poem, a scientist could be thinking of how many cubic meters of water, what, you know, a biologist could be thinking what more marine life. It's still the ocean and your perception just changes and that's really what the epics have been about. Uh, what has been very exciting is that it, they've also taught me to question the way I look at things. So the last four years I met this fascinating leather shackle property and his name is Guduraj and he's from Hassan district, district in Karnataka. And our Mahabharat is a collaboration with him essentially. So uh, we spent a year and a half reading about the Mahabharat. I think I've just yet read about 10% of the material in the world. And uh, I was really reading the age. Uh, so I thought it's important to stop because you could just go on reading the Mahabharat and die and be born and go on reading the Mahabharat. So it was time to really work on the performance. Uh, so we reached a stage where we had to stop. Let's look at you know, now starting the show. And we zeroed in on these 13 characters and uh, the script writer and I and Guruaj even sit together and we'd be like, okay, we've cracked uh, this character, we've cracked Dronachari. Uh, uh, I've got the scene, it's sorted. It's easy, he heard that his son had died and he put the weapons down and he's going to die. And then Guruaj said like, oh, he could come and say, how did he get better? Kyun dala ho hai kya? So how is Guruaj going to come and say, उसको तो पता था उसका बेटा चिरंजीवी है।
and apply it in our performance. You should display the work. No, 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 so it's
very important for us is that we don't hide the puppeteer. In fact, the puppeteer is a very important part of the entire uh, performance. Uh, sometimes the body of the puppeteer becomes the landscape for the puppeteer. Sometimes the puppeteer is a real cool actor. And, uh, and so this performance was made, uh, the one you saw was made in 2005, but it's still running and touring and it's changed a lot. I was watching it and thinking this is one of the first videos on the show that doesn't really look like this anymore. Uh, it's quite different. But what has happened increasingly is uh, our puppets have stopped having full bodies. We are now engaging much, much more with things like this. And this essentially is where you have nothing. You don't have the rest of the body. You just have a dismembered part. And Like this to you have the puppeteer who is the actor who is also manipulated by the puppet and is manipulating the puppet and it starts getting just a little bit complex. But it suddenly starts.
could also give you a massage. <laughs> so, um, we started to discover that the distinction is very important between mask and puppet and to really understand how uh, when you start looking at anatomy in parts and you work with this isolation, so the hand is one aspect of it, the head attached to another part of your body is another aspect of it. And for us, uh, increasingly we found that this are, these are very interesting devices to really get into the audience's head, uh, to, to talk about the psychology of the character. And uh, uh, if you saw about Ram, it's really telling a story of Ram. Uh, there is one moment, however, where you hear what he's hearing in his head. But in the Mahabharata, the entire story is of what's going on inside the character's head. Um, and uh, for us, the characters in the Mahabharata really lend themselves to this. Uh, there is the character as has been presented in certain mainstream versions of the epic. And there are all these questions the character constantly asks himself or herself. The beliefs they come from and uh, the decisions that they make in their life which make the war inevitable. So that's the focus of the play. And uh, uh, what you saw in About Trump, three people came with one puppet with a particular relationship. We've tried to take that just a little bit further and see what is this relationship between the manipulator and the manipulated. Uh, is it only one sided or is there more going on? So, I will just show you the next video. The last video of today.
No, I can't do it. Can't stop. I can serve her in family wise strong gestures. Stop. Stop. No. I'm a prisoner of this demeaning compulsion. I lose and then I lose again. I don't gamble or get rid of the next round. I gamble for the delicious joy of losing. Only when I lose is there a next round.
bring it to life later or any other kind of uh, this is truly random I mean, what do you think is that if the audience this audience is about it? There's a lot being written about it right now. There's a certain uh, Polish professor uh, whose name is Henry Q. Gorski. He devoted his life to understanding this and he puts it really well. He calls it uh, uh, opalescence. So this duality we oscillate between yeah. the puppet is alive, the puppet is dead. The puppet is alive, the puppet is dead. And uh, children as well, well as adults, I mean now children know this as well. You know it's dead, but you believe it's alive. You know it's dead, you feel it's laughing or crying. So this duality is uh, is really interesting. And in an actor, you know so and so is X Y Z, but he seems like Othello. So you have those moments which we as human beings are so willing to do. Um, yesterday, I pulled out the puppet for Samira's dog, and, and, and she went crazy. For her, the puppet was real. So, but we are going through this duality where it's not real, but oh my god, it's crying. How is that happening? And I think that space in between is so powerful for puppetry because you could say and do so much. There's more license. Yeah, lots of license. Lots of license. But it also uh, brings, I think, puppetry through a very stark position of life performance does anyway. So much the heads of the audience, as long as you're giving the right Yeah, it's kind of Yeah, it has to do with the film and live performance. Yeah. But I don't know, you want to say something very interesting because the gentleman there asked you a question about the public dogs being alive, but you also talked about the difficulty actors have about being puppeteers. Because it's. A lot of actors do come to us and want to be puppeteers, and I have to show you this because there's no way of explaining. So this is very often an actor playing a puppet. Nobody comes, uh, arrives on a camel anymore or horses. So 
many, I mean, it's already a contemporary existence. What we're really trying to see is uh, how much are they adapting and changing scripts and how much are they able to do it? Uh, because there's always that thing of, oh, are we diluting? Uh, and this is really a tricky question. I mean, I don't know if there's any answer to it. Uh, I think at this point, we're all searching for answers together. The traditional puppeteers I work with, uh, their, main, their main challenge at this point is, so you have the villages that you used to go to traditionally. You have your ritual context. If you see in Palghat in Kerala, where Tol Pabakuthu shows happen, there are 21 night performances. You have to do the 21 nights because uh, the Bhadrakali ritual demands it. For the first night, the second night, and the last night, there is an audience. I stayed for 18 nights and there was nobody with me. And the puppeteers play a CD and they play. And they're playing for the baby, but they know really there's, there's no audience there. So, but they have really adapted. What they've done is they've done a three hour Mahabharata in Ramadan. And every audience is willing to give those three hours, but nobody really has 21 nights in the so, this is how they have adapted and changed. And of course, they've got brickbats, but say, you know, you've shortened the Ramayana, you've shortened the Mahabharata. But I think left to their own devices, the performer uh, is constantly adapting to new markets, new situations, new realities. The problem happens when you have these interventions, which are well meaning but really are disastrous. So, in Odisha, um, suddenly there was a the, the policy decision was that the puppets were really crude. I don't know who decided it, but it was decided the puppets are really crude. But actually they're really powerful and really beautiful because they have jagged edges they're crude. So MFA students were called in from the art school and now all the puppets look like calendars. So like calendar art. They're terrible. And music students were called in from so the art students have a place in life and you know, but not in the, the traditional puppet theatre form. That has to be completely the artist's prerogative to reinvent and rediscover. Now, taking that as a base of my question, um, we clearly understand that it could probably be, I could be wrong, but you could say it is a figurative abstract where you do understand there's a figure, but even if it's not like a figure, when you did it with a shoe or with a sandal, it wasn't a figure, it, it's figurative. Now, if you move like an artist, Dollars, you know, a normal puppet to a very uh, metamorphic entity as a puppet. You now, what do you think impacts the user more? Is it, like for example, a painting could very easily, you know, showcase sorrow with another drop of, you know, tears and like that. But then puppetry is very different. It's very abstract. So, you think an abstract art impacts more on an audience? And how because it was very impactful. So we I and I could go for everybody, we all had these moms and those abstract. I think what happens is when you uh, give less to the audience, so you take this, a smaller step towards them, they take a much larger step towards you. So if I over explain it, you know, and, and it's increasingly happening in many forms where everything's explained. Now this is happening. So now I'm trying to show you this, and now I think that's so uh, underestimates our intelligence and our ability to engage. The minute you take this step back, and I've always seen this with audience, they, the real you know, engagement begins to happen. Uh, and so less is more in that sense. Uh, I think with puppets you're constantly projecting. It's all projection. Uh, the belief that it's character is in your head. The belief that it's alive is in your head. Uh, so you are willing to come that extra mile and believe more. So the abstraction really helps that. If, if it was too tight, and if this is a fine balance, I mean there are, it'll be very hard to set down rules about this. It's really a fine balance. But I think it helps that the, the space of, for the audience to project a certain reality increases its expands. I read somewhere that you chose 13 untold stories from my So as a puppeteer, I'd like to know what was it that differentiated these characters from a vast number of untold stories from my uh, Well, some of them were uh, known characters, but are untold stories like Shakuni. I think we were really looking at how black and whites, 
you know, are, are, are viewed as this kind of black shot, he's like this horrible guy, and uh, this is like this wonderful guy, and so and so is really wrong, and so and so is really in the right. But in life, as in the Mahabharata, as in everything else, it really isn't so. So the idea was to pick up characters and really look at, look at the layers in it, uh, to experience to experience all these dualities within the characters. And yes, some of them were definitely more puppetes. So it really helped. Uh, like the stories in the head of the horses, in the head of these characters, it really helped. Uh, so Shakuni, everyone knows, Yudhishthir, everyone knows, but to look at that aspect of them and to really not look at them as only one kind of person was the most important dragon person. So why you have to ask our audience, we're still grappling with this. Uh, but uh, yes, with, with Shakuni, a lot of people uh, were a little shocked. They didn't know this part. Mm -hmm. uh, they were quite shocked. And even with Yudhishthir, they know this story, but somehow this is the aspect that they not looked at too much. Uh, but maybe the gambling was an addiction, that, that, that possibility. Uh, is also somehow makes you a little more compassionate towards him, but somehow also makes you understand that he was so much more of a doer than we thought he was. So much more of a player in the whole scheme, in the whole scheme of things. So those are things that do hit home. Does something like this, something called objects? Yes. There's no movement. Yeah. You don't move them. You know, people have to do the process, so people don't move puppets. So how do they enhance Well, I am not an authority on object theatre, but uh, I know that it's very different from puppet theatre because essentially the animation of giving of life in a puppet and the puppet head could be a shoe. But the minute the puppet is an object, uh, it's not a breathing entity. But it's Definitely a theatrical device. It takes on a persona or a presence, but it needn't be living. And that's a very crucial difference. Because the puppet necessarily has to be breathing living creature. She talked to Sadanda after this because she's knows what she's about the object here. Yeah, just so the object the object is the object and it has to be the object in the in the life. It does not have to come to life, it does not have to animate itself, but the essential you want the audience's eye to look at the objectness of the object. So, yeah. There is an object of performance that you can bring in, remember? Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. So you can experience the objectness of the object. <laughs> Objectively. Most of the puppet shows I've watched in the movie are slow and deliberate. Is there any particular style that has a faster movement or is it that property is always slow and deliberate? Uh, no, I think the, uh, the choice of what is slow and deliberate and what is fast uh, is what puppet theatre is about. Uh, so yes, a lot of things are slow and deliberate, but if you saw Hanuman, yeah. he's essentially fast. <laughs> he is essentially not slow and deliberate. Uh, after like after five fast movements, we slow it down just to highlight something. That's because the character is doing most of the motion. But when you're treating puppets as an object, do they actually move? I mean, is there a style that they can move fast or is it? No, when actors are not playing, that was the puppet that was the guy, the living man that was moving around with the puppet. So that that can be like faster than I'm saying. Are they often automated or is it always manual and slow? Not slow, but manual, yes. I mean, the manual aspect of puppetry is very important. Uh, there is something now called animatronics, which is uh, automated. So there's some, the puppeteer is actually outside the uh, remote control. He still manipulates, but from a distance. So that's different from this actual. Uh, so even this puppet, if I move fast, would move fast. I mean, it's possible. The only thing is that uh, very fast movements are not desirable because it's like animation. Yeah. You know, the eye can only discern 
a certain number of frames per second and we are deeply aware of that. If I move very fast, even if this is very fast, after a point your eye is, uh, see the blur yeah. instead of movement. So yes, we are very aware that even a fast movement has uh, certain punctuations to enhance the fastness of movement. So when Anwar is flying across, the legs move really fast, but he stops. So it's, it's a talk and fun go game, but uh, with a deep awareness that you cannot hold a very fast movement for a very long time. You're bound to see just, you know, just blurs of color. And that's a problem. And similarly, you can't do only slow movement because it's boring. So you have to punctuate it with a sudden talk to really keep it living alive because we don't do only slow movements or only fast movements as living beings. So when one topic is manipulate your fast movement and slow movement at the same time, that means manipulating both is great in your body. Yeah, absolutely. Right absolutely. Right. absolutely. Yeah. All the time. We do a lot of training for left brain, right brain stuff. I mean, one of the extent we did this. <laughs> and then we do, you know, uh, 10 levels of this, very complex levels of this. Uh, so one of the exercises that we have to do is. Uh, and this is really interesting. To do this and to do this, you're using two sides of the brain. And then if you do this, you're using two sides of the brain. And if you do this together, you're using two sides of the brain. And we are constantly doing this. We have to do glove puppets. This is the training. Hours of this. Hours of this. So reverse circles. And uh, so you have to be, if you have two puppets in two hands and one is saying this and the other is only looking, looking at it very slowly and this one's talking, then uh, it's two different movements you're doing. In the Buddha move, you've got the waist of the puppet and you've got the hand and the waist has to be static and the hand has to move and the waist has to move this way but the hand has to move this way. So you're really doing two different movements all the time. <laughs>